Well, we are kicking off a new series today. It's called If You Love Me. If You Love Me. And we're really wanting to look at what authentic love for Jesus looks like in our day-to-day lives, in our everyday relationships. What does it mean to authentically express our love and our worship for Jesus? And so to kick us off today, I want to start by asking you to think about your favourite perfume or your favourite aftershave. And the person next to you might be wearing a lovely scent. (laughs) And you just, there's something about it that uh, is, it's quite unassuming. It's not overpowering. People notice it and comment on it all the time. What are you wearing? You smell beautiful. Who gets comments like that? It's good. It's better than the opposite. (laughs) Sometimes, you know, beautiful fragrances can remind us of something. A favourite place, a favourite memory, it captures our interest. We're just like, what is that smell? I had that experience. I walked into my house this week and I had a a beautiful candle that Nikki had given me and I had the lid off and I walked in and I walked past it and I went, what is that smell? And I went over to it and I went, oh, it's that candle. It was just so beautiful. Camellia and lotus flower, stunning. What about when you smell fresh bread just out of the oven? Who forgot to have breakfast and now you're like, sorry, stop talking about bread. (laughs) What about good coffee? Oh, I had a lot of amens for that one. That's good. Or when you get home or when you, you know, you come back or when you, you start to smell that, just that smell of roast lamb or roast pork or something. Some of you are like, stop thinking about lunch. (laughs) What about flowers, the beautiful smell of flowers? You know, um, often when I see a beautiful flower, I just have to go and smell it and see what the fragrance is like. And there's been a couple of occasions, Merrin, where um, you've done a beautiful display in our flowers in reception and I've walked over and your roses are just the most gorgeous smell. Where is Merrin? Is she here? No, I'll have to tell her that later. Beautiful. But our lives are meant to carry the fragrance of Jesus. Our lives are meant to carry the attractive fragrance of Jesus. All the time, at home, at work, at school, at uni, people are observing us. They really do take notice when we say we love Jesus. They look for evidence that it's true. And where do they look? They look at our lives. Our lives are meant to carry the attractive fragrance of Jesus. In 2 Corinthians, it says... Our lives, Paul says, our lives are a Christ-like fragrance rising up to God. In the message paraphrase, it says we are an aroma redolent with life. And redolent means strongly reminds you of something, strongly suggests something. To suggest life to people, that's awesome. To remind, what is, you know, you might have had someone to say, there's something about you. Because when you see someone who's full of life, you want to spend time with them. You want what it, what it is that they have. <laughs> you wonder what it is that's so different about them. And so through this series, we're actually asking ourselves, does my life carry the sweet-smelling fragrance of Jesus' presence? Am I authentically living out my claim to love and follow him? And maybe you're here and you're not even sure what you think about Jesus yet. Maybe someone in your life you, you have a respect for, invited you to come along and you thought, well, okay, why not? And here you are, you're in church. (laughs) And you're definitely not sure what you think about Jesus. Well, I don't believe that it's an accident that you're here today. And I want you to encourage you, be so bold as to ask you not to check out and think, this is the boring bit, I'm going to think about my roast lunch. But actually... To think, all right, if there is a God, if he's real, what does he want to say to me? And here's a really interesting question, one you have maybe have never thought about. Why do people claim to love Jesus? Like, people might claim to follow his teachings, but you might be hearing you think, that's really strange. Like, why do people claim to love and follow Jesus? Wasn't he just some dead historical guy that lived a long time ago? What is with that? I 
Well, this series and what I want to share with you today is that there's nothing and no one that compares to Jesus. You've heard lots of talk and singing about Jesus this morning. (laughs) But there's nothing and no one who compares to Jesus. And so the Bible describes him as the word of life. Or even sometimes as the word. And you might have thought, even Christians here today, why, do we, why is Jesus called the word? Like why, why does the Bible actually call him that? Well, in 1 John 1, we read, That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at and our hands have touched, this we proclaim concerning the word of life. The life appeared and we have seen it and testify to it. And that was written, like Tim said before, by the Apostle John. Now, John was the disciple that Jesus loved. He wrote the Gospel of John. He wrote the letters John 1, 2, and 3. He wrote Revelation. He received the vision of Revelation on the island of Patmos when he was exiled there. In church history, we know he was the last apostle to be alive. He was known as the theologian. He's so profound, John. (laughs) He was actually at the cross next to Mary, the mother of Jesus, when Jesus was crucified. And Jesus entrusted his mother to John. I think John is underrated. I want to have a massively long conversation with John when I get to heaven. Peter gets a big rap. Paul gets a lot of, you know. But John, I reckon, is a pretty phenomenal person. But he was saying... I was one of the people who saw Jesus with my own eyes. I actually saw him up close and personal for three years. I was actually at the place where he was crucified. I actually had a conversation with him after he rose from the dead. I saw him in action with my own eyes. This John, talking with the authority of someone who was a first-hand witness, you know, like if there's a news story happening, the news team scrambled to get someone who's seen Firsthand, what has happened, and tell us from their point of view what happened. This was John. So he says, We proclaim what we have heard, we have seen, we have looked at what our hands have touched. We testify that we have seen the word of life. And he goes on in his, his gospel, he actually opens with these profound words in John chapter 1, the first three verses In the beginning was the word. And the word was with God. And the word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him, all things were made. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. And then in verse 14, he says, The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son, who came from the Father, full of grace. And truth. You see, nothing and no one compares to Jesus. And John wants to make sure that we get this. He said, You know what? It's taken me three years, and depending on when he wrote this letter, and a lifetime of coming to try and comprehend this. <laughs> he starts his gospel by telling us the most ultimate things about Jesus that he can. He doesn't want us to take three years or a lifetime he tells us in three verses the most amazing things John Piper says he wants us to have in our minds fixed and clear from the beginning of his gospel the eternal majesty and deity and creator rights of Jesus Christ we're meant to read this gospel awestruck that the man at the Cana wedding and at the well with the Samaritan woman and on a mountain with his disciples and a crowd of 5,000 plus people is the creator of this universe. It's as if he's saying, in the very first words out of the end of my pen, I will stun you and blow you away with the identity of this man who became flesh and dwelt among us. John means for us to read every word of this gospel with the clear, solid, amazed knowledge that Jesus Christ was with God and was God and that the one who laid down his life for us created the universe get your head around that one (laughs) that's amazing 
John wants you to know and believe in a magnificent Saviour. Whatever else you may enjoy about Jesus, John wants you to know and treasure Jesus in his infinite majesty. He takes three verses. (laughs) He's so profound. The Bible describes Jesus as the Word because nothing and no one can compare to Jesus. Under inspiration from the Holy Spirit, John's saying, the words Jesus said, they're the truth of God. Jesus, the person, he's the truth of God. And so when you unite them together, everything that Jesus did, his virgin birth, uh, his ministry on this earth, uh, how he went about healing people and raising people from the dead, um, his teaching and his miracles, his dying and his rising, Jesus himself is the final and decisive good news message of God. All the revelation, all the truth, all the witness, all the glory, all the light, all the words that came out of Jesus in his living and teaching and dying and rising, all that can be summed up in one name, the Word. The first, the final, the ultimate, the decisive, the absolutely true and reliable Word. Nothing and no one compares to Jesus. There's some opportunity for excitement in this room because this is true we're excited we're supposed to be passionate about this the writer of Hebrews agrees in in chapter one he says in the past God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets at many times and in various ways but in these last days he has spoken to us by his son He has spoken definitively. Tim talked about the finished work of Jesus on the cross and the finished work of Jesus on the cross says, God loves you. God is not angry at you. God made provision so that you could know him forever as your heavenly father. God has made a way for you to come into his family and be adopted forever as his child. God sent his son who shed his blood, whose wounds brought our ransom. Thank you, Lord. But that's not even finished yet. (laughs) He went around and he showed us what God is like because he is God. (laughs) And then he was buried. Death couldn't hold him down. Tanny, you were like singing it this morning, declaring the truth in this place. Death couldn't hold him down. He is risen forever. He is alive and he's here by his Holy Spirit because he rose to the Father. He appeared first to his disciples. He rose to the Father. He's seated at the right hand of the Father. He poured out the Holy Spirit to come and live and fill any person who says, Jesus, I put my trust in you. So now we have a new power in operation on the inside. We've been brought into a new family. We have a new life. We have a new everything. (laughs) There's nothing and there's no one who compares to Jesus. And you can receive his forgiveness and you can know that you know that you know that you know him today. Maybe you've heard about him. Maybe you've been at church and about at Christian events or grown up and you've known about his teachings, but you don't know him. You can come to know him today. So why do people claim to love Jesus? Man, the list is endless. <laughs> we love him because he first loved us. We love him because the Holy Spirit has helped us to see who he really is, the one and only son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. We love him because he saved us. He's brought us back into relationship with God. There's endless reasons why Christians and Christ followers love Jesus. The challenge for us is not so much our words, but our lives. Don't you reckon? Mm -hmm. Am I authentically living out my claim to love and follow Jesus? None of us like to think of ourselves as hypocrites. Hypocrisy is claiming to have moral standards or beliefs to which your own behaviour does not conform. One really hot day when they had guests for dinner, a mum asked her four-year-old little boy if he wanted to give thanks at the dinner table. But I don't know what to say, the boy complained. (laughs) Oh, well, why don't you just say what I say, sweetie, she said. 
the little boy bowed his head and mumbled, Oh, Lord, why did I invite these people over on a hot day like this? <laughs> I love how honest kids are. They're so good. That wasn't me, by the way. <laughs> but I have said some silly stuff that my kids have copied. Oh, man. Hypocrisy is pretense, pretending you're doing something, but really you're not. You're just pretending. And hypocrite comes from the Greek word for a stage actor, one who wears a mask. It is not necessarily the fact that we sin that makes us a hypocrite. It's our refusal to acknowledge it as sin, own up to it as sin. You know, Jesus was the friend of sinners. But he spoke pretty strongly to people who said, do what I say, but don't do what I do. The religious leaders and the teachers of the law. When we don't admit areas where our lives contradict what we say, we are being inauthentic. And can I just say that my son put me in time out this week? <laughs> he is a stickler for if you say something, you've got to follow through with it. And so I've committed to him a couple of times when I was supposed to be home this week and I was five, seven, ten minutes late and he's looking at the clock and he says, Mum, you've got to work on that. I think you need to go to time out. <laughs> So I said, you're right, I do. And I wanted to model for him what I want him to do. So I went into time out for two minutes, came out and apologised and said, Angus, that's not okay. When mummy gives her word, I want to follow through with it. (laughs) We are all hypocritical occasionally because none of us are perfect. But Jesus sees right through any and every pretense. He, time and time again, the Gospels, he nails nails people right between the eyes (laughs) he knows even what we're thinking and he says if you love me keep my commands he says it if you love me keep my commands in John 14 if we willingly and habitually persist in going against what he commands but say all the right things and outwardly pretend that we're following him we are being hypocritical We're not being authentic in our love for him. And so this is what John's talking to in his letter to the church. He says, this is the message we've heard from him and declare to you. God is light. In him there is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and we do not live out the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. Walking with Jesus means walking in the light. It means that we must always be growing in our love for God and for others and growing in our likeness to Jesus. And God will work with anything. (laughs) He doesn't try and change us all at once, but he just, if there's a willingness and and a willingness to listen and a willingness to, you know what, God? I need your help. I admit that I sinned. I stuffed up in this. I need you. You know, walking is about our direction. When you're walking, some, you're going somewhere. Walking in darkness is persistent, willing movement away from what we know is the right thing to do. And when God light, God's light shows us that it's not right, we do it anyway. We push away the truth from ourselves. Or it's when we know we need to do what he's asked us to do and we do a Jonah. (laughs) We say, one ticket to not Nineveh, please. That's how the Jesus Storybook Bible says it. (laughs) For kids, one ticket to not Nineveh, please. (laughs) I'm not talking about stumbling. I'm not talking about if, if you're... The, the direction of your heart is towards the Lord. We all make mistakes and we all stumble. We all trip. Some of you are limping, but you're still walking. You had battles bombarding you, smashing you, <laughs> but you're still walking in the light. Everything's been thrown at you, but you are continually turning your face and your posture towards him. Or maybe you're struggling with a persistent area of temptation. You're thinking, oh, this is so frustrating. 
Just keep turning away from yourself and looking at him. Keep turning away. Keep looking at him. Keep saying, Jesus, I need you. Jesus, I thank you that you've already won the victory and that you're going to work in me and give me the strength to resist this temptation. I'm looking to you. I'm walking to you. I'm walking in that direction. And he walks right beside us. He's not off in the distance. He's right beside us. His Holy Spirit's in us. He's right beside us. It's like Peter when he's sinking, on, when he's trying to walk on the water and he's sinking because he looks around and he goes, I can't do this. Jesus goes, got ya. I'm right here. I got ya. <laughs> but willful disobedience to God in an area can harden our hearts and dull our ears to his voice. All of us have our stubborn moments where we turn away or God's saying, you know, I want you to surrender with this. And we're like, no, I'm not sure if I want to do that, God. We have a little standoff. (laughs) But we all face choices. Are we going to take a step in the direction? So we might be over here. We're like, nah, I don't really want to do that, God. And he's like, the Holy Spirit's right there next to us going, "You you need to go that way. Yeah, I don't really want to. Yeah, but, you know, God wants to lead you into light. He wants to lead you into life. You need to turn around. This is not good for you. As soon as we turn around, we recognize Jesus is right there with us. Because the easiest person to deceive is ourselves. What's one step? What's one step, Jesus? You still forgive my sins. What's one step? Well, you know, one step can become steps. Steps can become pathways. Pathways can become a lifestyle of refusing to follow Jesus anymore. Our our hearts are hardened to his voice. Can lead to a lifetime of regret. You know, when we walk in darkness, we align ourselves with ungodly demonic activity, (laughs) which wants to empower us. Yes, you deserve it. Come on, one more step. You're fine. What are you talking about? That's not really sin. Everyone else is doing it. No one's going to see. No one's going to know. The enemy wants to dull our sensitivity to hearing God's voice so we come out from under his loving protection and guidance for our lives. But if Jesus is in you, (laughs) there's a new and greater power in operation. Tim shared it in the first service. It says, later on in the letter 1 John, it says, the spirit who lives in you is greater than the spirit that lives in the world. And you know, the prayers of the saints, people who pray (laughs) when we see someone, okay, well, they're getting a bit close. Okay, well, I'm going. As we pray, the Holy Spirit just ramps up his activity. The Holy Spirit is working to empower us to walk and keep on walking in the light. That means willing cooperation with the Holy Spirit. When the Lord shines his light, when he says, you know what, Cass, don't worry about, I know you can see all this, but I want to focus right now on this here. I want you to be obedient to me in this. And when we cooperate with him, we say, yes, you're right, you will light. (laughs) That is dark. (laughs) I want to trust you. I want to come into the light, Lord. I want to continually move towards what you asked me to do. I unconditionally surrender. I turn around and I face you. Because I know that you are committed to me because you died for me. (laughs) What direction are you walking in today? We're to be and live who we are now in Christ. We're to be and live who we are now in Christ, the finished work of Christ. Uh, Christ. We're to walk it out. Ephesians 5, it says, verse 8 to 11, it says, But among you there must, there must not even be a hint of sexual immorality or any kind of impurity or of greed, because these are improper for God's holy people. Nor should there be obscenity, foolish talk or coarse joking which are out of place, but rather thanksgiving. This line blew me away. For you were once darkness. Not you were once in darkness. Shows you the depravity and the hugeness of sin, hey? 
For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Live as children of light. For the fruit of the light consists in all goodness, righteousness and truth. And find out what pleases the Lord. Have nothing to do with fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. We don't have to please him, get his favour and attention, but we want to delight him with our lives. We want to say thank you with our lives. We want to honour him with our lives. And so when the light of his Holy Spirit is shining, it's not to spoil our fun. (laughs) It's actually to lead us into life, to lead us away from lies and torment and things that will destroy us and destroy our relationships and destroy Draw the good things that God has for us. It says, have nothing to do with fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. Walking in the light means when, because we all do it, we go against the command of Jesus, we own up to it. We repent. That's a, you basically do a U-turn. I'm wrong. You are right, God. I'm not going that way anymore. I'm going your way. We agree it's wrong. We decide to go God's way. We talk about it and admit it was wrong. That's confession. I was wrong. I am sorry. Thank you, Lord, that you have already forgiven me. (laughs) And then we take whatever practical steps necessary to be obedient. We don't wait. If God's speaking to us, we do it. We're quick to obey. There's so many times where God has... been dealing with me (laughs) continually it's a continual process I don't know about you but it is for me if we're really honest there's times when I'm sitting in this service and God's saying you know what you need to go and apologize that way you spoke to your husband you need to say sorry yeah but I always say yeah but you need to say it (laughs) do you want to have the fragrance of Christ in your life He's challenged me about the way I spend money. He's challenged me about the way I keep my word. He's challenged me about what I set before my eyes. He's challenged me about my thinking. His light shines in areas of our life. He's challenged me about um, complaining and resentment. What does he challenge you about? Because we can't obey him in our own strength. When the light of God's word shines on an area, he wants to deal with it in our life, but he knows we can't do it on our own. We're not supposed to go, yes, all right, God, I'm going to try really hard to be good this week. (laughs) We can't do it. We need his help. And we thank him for his finished work on the cross. We ask for his empowering. And then we don't wait. We go and do it. And we believe in faith that as we go and do what he's asked us to do, he's going to help us. Some of you need to get on the phone and have a conversation with someone this afternoon. There's, um, there's broken down relationship happening in your life. And as I'm talking, God's speaking to you about it. We continually need the Holy Spirit's help to walk in the light. And in Christ we have it. Hallelujah. (laughs) This verse has been so life-giving to me. So freeing, Philippians 2.13. For God is working in you. Even when you feel like, oh, I gave in to that too many times this week. Oh, no, God, I should be better. No, God's already working in you. Even the desire that you want to... See, that change in your life is evidence that he's at work. God is working in you. When someone, I remember when Pastor, I was in a class or something, Pastor Barry was sharing this verse and showing how God has spoken to me. And tears ran down my eyes because I went, yes, it's not me striving. (laughs) It's Jesus (laughs) by his spirit working in me, even on my desires. And he gives you the power to do what pleases, what delights, what honours, what reverences, what glorifies him. As we cooperate with him in ever increasing measure, the work of the Holy Spirit is to grow fruit in our life. Fruit that looks like Jesus. Holiness. 
Holiness is being like Jesus in our character. As we listen to him and put his words into action, as we look away from our inability and look to him and what he has done and what he can do and what he is working in us, we can actually change. And the bright light of Christ shines more and more in and through us. One John one, verse seven. Let's pick it up from there. But if we walk in the light as He is in the light, and we we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus His Son purifies us from all sin, if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just, and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar and his word is not in us. My dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus the righteous one. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins and not only for ours but for the sins of the whole world. You have an advocate. The Bible talks about the Holy Spirit as an advocate, our helper, our comforter, our counsellor. But it also, in this verse, John talks about Jesus as our advocate. What's an advocate? It's the one who comes alongside, like a lawyer. So in God's courtroom, when you think about my week and how I did with this, how I'm going in this area, some of us put ourselves in a courtroom and God's the judge we're like, okay, yep, I'm here again. Okay, yeah, that was wrong. Yeah, I understand. Help me, God. I need your help. And off we go. But Tim Keller helped me to see this so powerfully. He says, you know what? Sometimes we put ourselves in the courtroom, but we're not actually in the courtroom anymore. If we're in Christ, our advocate has gone in for us. We don't go into the courtroom anymore. We're not walking in there, oh, hanging our heads in shame. We're like, Lord, you know, I did do that. That was wrong. But thank you that I've got an advocate. And he has gone into that place where you are the judge and he's taken and said, I've paid for this. I've paid the penalty. I've paid the punishment. I've taken the price. Whatever it is, I've paid it. They can go free. You're not in the courtroom. Do you know how freeing that is? (laughs) You actually can own up to stuff and go, yeah, I did it wrong. Because you know fundamentally at the core of who you are that you are forgiven. And so we want to come around the Lord's table. And if you have sinned, the blood of Jesus covers you. If you've never come to the Lord's table and you think, I'm not worthy to come. None of us are, that's the point. Jesus died on our behalf in our place to bring us to God. So we're going to take the elements. We're going to focus on what Christ has done. We're going to thank him with all of our hearts. We're going to confess between us and him some stuff in our life that we need to unload and say, yes, God, I agree. I'm turning around. That's not right. And then we're going to trust him to fill us with his light and his life and his empowering presence. And then we're going to After this, some of us might need to take some practical action.